Hi, it's Lauren Lockman from the Tanglewood Wellness Center in Costa Rica. And I have been asked this morning to talk a little bit about permaculture. You may or may not be aware of this, but we practice permaculture here. We, uh, the center is, is uh, somewhat based on permaculture principles and techniques, and we're employing more of them all the time as we have a chance to start working more of the land and focusing less on the buildings and the immediate environment here. And so I want to share with you guys what that means. What is this all about? Uh, what, what relevance it might have for you? And, um, and what relevance it might have to the world, in fact? And let me start out by, by pointing out something. It's kind of interesting. Um, you know, in, over the last 25 or 30 years now, in the United States and probably many other Western countries, the organic segment of the produce market has been the fastest growing segment of the produce market. And so what would you expect to happen based on that? What would you expect all the commercial growers and, and distributors to do? Low, um, Bash organics, right? Mm -hmm. So they're, what they're out there saying is, there's no evidence organics any better. No, you know, it's really just the same. It's just you're paying a lot more money and there's no benefit to it. Sure. So on Monday, a university in England published a paper which examined 354 studies that looked at organic produce and came to the remarkable conclusion that organic produce is better. It's more nutritious and it has less poison in it. So, um, oh, this sounds kind of obvious to most of us here, I hope. Um, it should be obvious. Um, the, the fact is that the majority of the produce in the world today is really not very high quality because it's being grown in ways that rape the land. That, that, you know, you, on your way here, if you came here from San Jose, you passed by a two or 3,000 acre pineapple farm. Monoculture. What does that mean? Just pineapples. Nothing else. Every plant is taking nutrients out of the soil and putting others back in. But if all you're growing is one thing, you're always taking the same nutrients out of the soil, you're putting back in what the plant doesn't need, and what happens is you wind up making the soil poorer and poorer quality. And so by growing plants the way we do, and of course in North America, where I'm from, the vast majority of the land is now given over to, anyone know? Corn, rice, soybeans, soybeans and wheat. And wheat. Yeah. That's it. That's where the vast majority of, of the land the acreage is being given to growing those crops. These crops are all relatively bad for the soil. Okay? And what farmers do, even when they're growing food, is they put back only what they need to to get produce. So in terms of, of somebody, I mean, uh, you know, my, my focus is on health. Uh, this channel, YouTube channel, is primarily about health. But permaculture is about the health of the planet. And if you don't think your health is connected to the health of the planet, you need to wake up because it's intimately connected. The reason that, that people are so sick today, one of the reasons, is because we've polluted the entire planet. So the soil, the water, the air is all polluted. We can't escape these things. I've talked about this before, but in a study done maybe 10 years ago, the average person, they tested a large group of people in North America for 75 persistent environmental toxins and found the average person had more than 50% of them in their tissue in measurable quantity. We're not eating the stuff. We're not even touching the stuff. The stuff has been out, most of it's been outlawed for years, decades in most cases, and it's still everywhere around us to the extent that everyone winds up with the stuff in their bodies. This is happening all over the place. It's happening in, in lots of countries all over the world. In Serbia, we were talking about Serbia this morning, in Serbia they use pesticides that are outlawed in the United States and most other Western countries because they're so toxic. And some of the produce there, you don't even want to touch it. It's so toxic. Okay? There are places on the planet that are much worse off because they're still using these incredibly toxic substances. Permaculture is a way of trying to undo some of that. It's a way of trying to create something that is sustainable and sane 
and actually good for the planet and for every other species. And it's based on a simple idea. In fact, it's based on the idea that I've shared with you guys over and over again. If you've been here already for, for six weeks or more, some of you have, you have heard me say probably at least twice a week one simple phrase. You can't improve on nature. Have you heard me say that a few times? Well, permaculture is the word, that the term actually comes from the marriage of permanent and agriculture. So we create monocultures of rice, soy, wheat, corn, or here, pineapples, or coffee, or oranges, and we wind up with something that's not sustainable. It's harming the soil all the time. It's an unnatural way to grow plants, and it winds up being harmful to the soil because of that monocrop. There's also some potential danger. Anyone uh, hear about, um, most of you are too young to, to well, I, was, I was, wasn't born yet either, but you guys know about the Great Potato Famine in Ireland? What happened? They grew one kind of potato, and there was a blight that destroyed all their crops. And they lived on potatoes, and all of a sudden they had nothing. Almost all their food was gone. Almost all their wealth was gone. Okay? So when you're depending on one thing, you're putting yourself at significant risk as well, especially when the health of that plant is relatively poor because it's monoculture, it's monocrop. What happens in a natural forest? How many of you have walked to the bottom of the property at some point? How many different plants do you think you saw there? Like thousands. Thousands is the right answer. Even trees, you know, in, a, in an acre of forest in North America, you're going to see roughly 20 to 25 different tree species. Here, in the same acre, you could have hundreds. In Tropical Nature, the book I've mentioned to you before, amazing book, the authors say that you could spend, these two guys, at the time they wrote the book, they'd spent their entire careers studying tropical biology. And one of them died shortly, actually before the book was published in a rafting accident. Young, relatively young man, but you know, they'd spent 15 or 20 years studying tropical biology, and they said you could spend your entire career as a tree specialist in a tropical rainforest and find trees all the time you couldn't identify. The diversity is so great here. It's so amazing here. The vast majority of, of species live in the tropics, okay, in the rainforest. So, what it's, it's completely unnatural to have huge expanses of land where there's one thing. Obviously, if you have a mango tree, you're going to have some other mango trees sprouting up nearby, right? But you're not going to have nothing but mango trees for a thousand acres. That's never going to happen. Because long before that mango tree could, could populate the entire thousand acres, there'd be hundreds, if not thousands, of other species coming in and doing the same thing, colonizing through other means. So what, what, one of the things that permaculture does is it creates food forests that mimic natural forests, where you have a variety of species. So you've got mangoes and avocados and citrus and rambutans and mame sapotes and cherimoyas and water apples and all kinds of other things all growing in the same area because each plant is taking different things from the soil and putting different things back in, you wind up with a much healthier ecosystem this way. If there's a problem, that, that let's say there's a problem that affects a particular crop, it doesn't affect the whole forest. You don't kill, you don't destroy the whole thing, you destroy one small part of it, okay? So it's, it's a completely different situation. But it's not just in the variety of plants, it's how you use them. It's how you get water to them. It's how you make the soil healthy. There's so many different aspects. One of the things we've, we've just looked at, and I'll show you guys who are still fasting later, is some of the ways you manage water with permaculture. And you want to manage water, and, and to be honest with you, it's much less critical here, where we get nearly 200 inches of rain per year, than it is in places like Jordan, where there are permaculture forests that are growing in places food forest where they, they have tons of food being produced five, six years 
without having to bring water in on a half an inch per year or two inches per year. Once you get it established, it's amazing what happens because the trees will hold bubbles of water underground. So once you get it established, they're actually self-sustaining. These guys saw how six, seven, eight-year-old and older banana plants are much weaker and being knocked down by the wind and producing less fruit and being much less vibrant in general than plants that are a year old that are planted using permaculture techniques where we ensure the, the highest quality nutrition and an abundant water supply. So they get a much better start that way. And we do the same thing with, with all kinds of uh, plants. It's not just bananas. We, there's a specific technique called banana circles, which I'll show you guys later. Banana circles, we do papaya circles. But for larger trees, we use a technique called swales, which essentially does the same thing. And it ensures tons of nutrition, tons of water, and much healthier plants as a result. And this works wonders in places like Jordan, you know, in the desert. But it's, it's effective anywhere. You can do it here, and you can do it any, any place in between, any climate in between, no matter how much rain you have or don't have. It works in Sweden. Needless to say, with a much shorter growing season, you're not going to have the, the same opportunities that you have here. You can't grow the same kinds of things. You can't grow the same quantity. The pineapples don't do that well, I understand. But, a little joke. Um, Got it. Yeah. But, you can, you can use permaculture anywhere to create an amazing abundance of, of life and food. And, and it's more, really just more than food. In fact, Bill Mollison talked with the, the founder of permaculture. I heard him on a radio program nearly 25 years ago, uh, or maybe 30 years ago, from Australia. And it, it completely caught, you know, it's like, wow, this, is, this makes perfect sense. It took me a long time. It took me until about five years ago to get certified as a permaculture instructor. But <clears throat> I've always, in the back of my mind, thought, okay, I need to start employing as much of this as possible. And Mollison was talking about how he started out on his own land with maybe five acres. And he planted as much as he could using these techniques he developed. And he had so much, by the time it developed, he had so much food growing, he couldn't even harvest it all himself. And he wound up inviting other families to come move onto the land with him because it was just way too much to do. He didn't want a, a commercial farm. He wanted to be people living on the land, but it was way too much for one family. And he said they didn't even try to harvest the highest fruit, like the mango tree right here. It's pretty tall. We, we don't have a pole long enough to get to the top branches. Could climb all the way up there, but, you know... It, it may or may not be worth it for a few mangoes at a time. You might have to do it every day to get a mango or two, right? When there's tons of mangoes that are ripe and falling off the tree and ready to pick, why bother? And he said something very interesting that you know, made me start thinking. He said, we leave the highest fruits for the birds and the bats. By attracting these animals, what are we doing? We're, well, we're creating a much greater diversity of life how many of you like mosquitoes? Well, guess what? Birds and bats eat them. So we have their natural predators. What do the birds do when they're hanging out in the tree? They eat mangoes. What else do they do? They poop. They poop. And the rain washes that sulfur-rich poop down to the ground where it fertilizes the tree. So we're creating this rich ecosystem that supports this whole diversity of life. I neglected to actually show you guys, but if we were to go into any of the places that have been, been cultivated for a while, for, the, for a year, I mean, nothing here is more than about a year old, because that's when I started planting here. And it's amazing, because if you think about it, and I'm going to see if I can maybe put together a little slideshow for you if I have time. Um, you know, it may not happen tonight, Ken. I'll get you pictures sometime, uh, if you want to see them. But uh, for the rest of you, you're going to be here for a while. 
I'll, I'm going to show you some pictures of what it was like before I got here, when I first got here, and after I got here, before we started planting, because there was nothing on the land. I mean, there was you know, the palm trees around the, the pool, the mango tree, this big hickory right here, but not much else. All the landscaping you see didn't exist. Okay, so it's amazing how much has shifted in just a year. It's amazing how much, if you look at our pictures on the Tanglewood Facebook page, it looks like a different place. Those pictures were taken six months ago. You can see the progression. Um, but if we were to look at the soil in those places that have been cultivated now for the longest time, you'd find rich black soil. Tons of organisms in it, tons of life, and it wasn't like that. It was hard clay in many places. Some of the soil here is pretty good, but not, not, not all of it. It changes quickly by using these techniques. So one of the things you'll notice here is there's, there's almost no bare soil anywhere. I don't leave bare soil. Why not? Well, the sun cooks it. Okay, that we get, you know, especially in the dry season, where we have sun all day long, without stop, and no rain. Maybe you know, two or three times it'll rain in, in three or four months. What happens is the sun cooks the soil. It becomes hard and dry. Earthworms can't live in it. Nothing can exist in it. It essentially becomes dead. Instead, what do we do? Well, you can mulch it. You can use straw or hay or leaves or, or cardboard or newspaper. But the best way is something that's alive. So you'll see peanut grass almost everywhere. These are the plants. You may not know the name. You can see, you can see some of it right here when you walk through the entranceway. Little green leaves, little yellow flowers. It's actually in the peanut family, although it doesn't make a legume. There's no peanut, but it's in the same family. And leguminous plants are, are valuable because they're all nitrogen-fixing plants. What does that mean? Well, there's nitrogen in the air. We're not just breathing oxygen, we're breathing a, a variety of different gases, and nitrogen's one of them. And plants have the ability, if you remember, we talked, well, some of you were here, we talked about this before, plants can, can change inorganic minerals into organic plant tissue with the help of organisms. Same thing, they can take things like nitrogen out of the air and put it into the soil. And we need it in the soil for healthy plant life. So peanut grass is actually, first of all, it's covering the soil so it doesn't get cooked. It's maintaining humidity. It's creating habitat for other species. So there's, there's going to be excrement from all kinds of organisms in there making the soil richer. And it's actually taking nitrogen out of the air and putting it into the soil. So the soil's richer all the time. It's healthier all the time. Okay? Um, it, it's also very interesting because if you, how many of you have done some gardening before? Ever have fun with weeds? I mean, sometimes you know, like you spend your whole life pulling weeds, right? Peanut grass prevents most of the weed seeds from getting to the ground so they don't get started. So once you get it, once you get it cultivated, it becomes really easy because there's very few weeds coming up. Now it has, it has a similar unwanted effect. We used to have these native cherry tomato plants self-seeding themselves everywhere. It doesn't happen anymore. We planted peanut grass everywhere and now the, the plant will grow, but the plant eventually dies. And all the seeds that we let, you know, the, the ones that were rotting on the plant or that were it, eaten into, we let them fall on the ground and see, reseed. The seeds don't make it to the soil anymore because the peanut grass is so thick. So it means we have to start those plants all the time ourselves instead of allowing that to happen or cultivate them in a place without it, right? Because it doesn't work so well for that. But for most purposes, it's, it's amazing. And there are other things you can use. But a living mulch like peanut grass is amazing. So it's just one more technique. Do you have, do you have a peanut grass alternative in the US or Western? There are alternatives all over the place, mm -hmm. but I don't know what they all are. Um, any leguminous plant will do the same thing. So any plant that produces beans okay. will, is a leguminous plant. It's a nitrogen fixing plant. You can use it the same way. People also use sweet potatoes. Um, there are plants that you can use all over the world that will serve the same function. Any leguminous plant's going to take nitrogen out of there and put it in the soil. And there are plants that may not be nitrogen fixing but still work very well as ground covers. So I started to say sweet potatoes are great because they grow rapidly. They produce a beautiful vine. 
which covers the ground and protects the soil and creates habitat and does all those things. It's not putting nitrogen in the soil, but it still is, is preventing the soil from getting cooked and creating the habitat and doing many other things. And eventually it, it'll wither and die and feed the soil. And of course, people that eat cooked food like them because they can dig them up and eat the potatoes. I don't have much use for sweet potatoes, but, um, but it's one thing that many people use with permaculture. There, what you want to do is make sure that you're using a plant, and you can Google it and find tons of information online, but you want to use a plant that's not competing with the plants that you're propagating. So one of the techniques I, I pointed out to you guys this morning is that under our fruit trees, there's no grass. In fact, there's no weeds. I mean, we're starting. I'm having the guys now with the orange trees that are further down on the property, we haven't really been doing anything with taking all the wild plants off of the soil and planting peanut grass. Because peanut grass is very minor competition for nutrients and water. It needs very little. Whereas grasses and other things are competing with the tree. So you don't want, you don't want to be growing fruit trees out of grass because you're actually competing with the tree. And, and how much space should you leave free of grass? I mean, it's nice to have grass under the tree. And we've actually put a little bit of grass under the mango tree. But mostly not, right? We put a little bit of grass so you can lay in the shade. But mostly not. The things that are under there are mostly not competing the way the grass does. We want the nutrients to be going to the tree as much as possible. Um, how wide it should be is the width of the canopy. Because in most cases, the width of the roots of the tree are going to mirror the width of the canopy. So if you've got a mango tree that's, that's branches are 40 feet in diameter, you want to have a 40 foot circle of peanut grass. Okay? So everywhere I've ever lived, we've had a little bit of grass. Like we, we just put some grass in in the last couple of weeks. Not much though. Now most people like they they're have these big yards of grass. I always had a little bit of grass and a whole bunch of garden. How much grass do you really need? Right? We're not going to have football games in the backyard. I mean, we go to the park if we want to do that. We, we will eventually create a big field here. So, because we have, an, we have 10 acres, if you want to play frisbee or something, there'll be a half acre of grass to go do that on. Or a quarter acre of grass. The rest of the land will be not grassy for the most part. Okay? Um, because in terms of the environment and growing food, grass isn't necessarily the best thing to be doing.